Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Pierre Dalancin. In the discourse of contemporary art over the past few decades, concepts like creativity or talent have become almost taboo. Art critics and curators often like to see themselves as engaged in a set of complex processes that bring together aesthetic, social, commercial and political ideas. But such a relational view obscures the long shadow of the figure of the visionary romantic artist toiling away at their aesthetic obsession, waiting to be revered by patrons and mentors. Well, it turns out that this visionary artist is alive and well, and that the competition for vision is stiff. A new book, Bound by Creativity, How Contemporary Art is Created and Judged, by sociologist Hannah Wall, finds this vision in New York, out of all places. Creativity and creative vision are key again. Hannah Wall is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I'm very happy to say that she joins me now to discuss her book, her work, and the New York art scene. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Thank you so much for having me. Hannah, I had so much fun with your book, and I want to first find out how you have landed in this incredible reverie of the New York art scene, how you came to do any of the things you do to turn up at the parties, at the artist studios at the art fairs. Where did all of this come from? Yeah, so that's a big question. And I can start by telling you about sort of how I came to this topic. And then another question that I think this evokes is about access and how do you get access to the art world? Um, so it was it was a long road to this topic. I mean, really, I was interested in art from a young age, loved going to museums, loved making art, um, took a lot of art classes, both in art history and studio art in college, despite the fact that I was majoring in sociology. So and up until I went to grad school for sociology, art and sociology remained separate interests to me. I thought art was what I did for fun. Um, that was sort of my personal enjoyment. And sociology was my academic life. And when I got to grad school, I was really fortunate to land at Northwestern University sort of by chance. And what I didn't really know when I got there was that it was one of the best places to study sociology of culture. Um, There were several professors specializing in that area. And so I realized then that you could actually merge the two. There was something called the sociology of art, which I hadn't fully realized until I got there. And so that really fascinated me. And I actually did a first ethnography, which was an ethnography in Chicago of an erotic arts club. And I studied uh, specifically the sensual figure drawing class. And so I was really interested there um, in how artists and models negotiated the boundaries between sensual, non-sexual, and pornographic, as well as how they were making aesthetic judgments. So this was a really fascinating study, but it left open many questions because what it didn't answer for me was how artists made creative decisions during the process of creation. Um, And the figure jars I was studying were mostly traditional. They were interested in figuration and accuracy and not in conveying an idea or a mood or an emotion through their work. And so this really brought me to the contemporary art world, because unlike figure drawing, contemporary art can be seen as potentially anything could be seen as good art. You could have a pile of rubble or a clothesline of socks. Um, These were all real works that (laughs) I witnessed in the art world, or in the case of one of the artists that I studied, uh, frozen cat food. And these could all be good works of art. They could be shown in museums. They could be sold for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. So I was really fascinated by this world precisely because there was such a lack of consensus around aesthetic judgment. And so for someone that was becoming increasingly interested in aesthetic judgment, this really pulled me in. How did you, how do you make aesthetic judgments, both as an artist, but also as a a gallerist, um, a, a, a collector? How do you make aesthetic judgments with this complete lack of a consensus over what is good art. So that's the story of how I came to the topic. Um, And then I think there's a separate story about how I gained entree into this field. 
So I came into this field with very few contacts, more a, a couple of friends of friends, that kind of thing. Um, and I started by interviewing artists in their studio. And that actually wasn't terribly difficult in terms of mm. access. Artists really like talking about themselves and their work. And so, and, and studio visits, when you go to a studio, that's sort of an established thing in the art world. So I wasn't doing something totally weird. And so I started by going to artist studios, gradually getting to the studios of more established artists. And some of those artists were comfortable connecting me to their dealers. Um, and so I started doing interviews with dealers, hanging out at exhibition openings. What I found to be really tough, um, in the beginning at least, was getting access to elite collectors. Because artists were happy to introduce me to their friends, even sometimes when they were closer to their dealers to introduce me to their dealers. Dealers would introduce me to artists. But both dealers and artists were really relying on collectors for their money. And so they were understandably really nervous about maintaining these professional relationships. And they weren't getting anything from me. And so why rock the boat for nothing? Um, so <laughs> I was really lucky finally that uh, Paula Cooper, who's a renowned dealer in the New York art world, incredibly generous as a person, said that, you know what, let me, can, uh, let me call a couple of my collectors and see if they would be willing to talk to you. And once I was able to talk to a couple collectors, that really opened the world to me because unlike artists who are relying on collectors, collectors are friends with other collectors and they're not professionally tied in the same way. So it wasn't such a big deal for them to say, let me, let me give you my friend's number. You can talk to um, that person as well. And the, there was really a symbiotic relationship between my field work and the interviews I was doing because the field work uh, led to more interviews. I was meeting people at these parties and saying, hey, can I come interview you sometime in the next couple of weeks? And then when I would do interviews, uh, this is something that you shouldn't do in everyday interaction. It's, um, it's definitely not socially acceptable, but I would basically invite myself to parties. So I would say, hey, I know this is a little weird, but um, next time you have a VIP party, next time you have an open house, can I come along? Or do you mind if I tag along when you go to see um, to see art shows with your husband? Um, and so, you know, some, sometimes <laughs> that, people that would say no. That is a good line. That Do you mind if I join your husband at this event? <laughs> and, and you. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and a lot of people said, some, sometimes people would say no, but sometimes they would say yes. And you sort of have to string together yeses when you're doing an ethnography. And if you can string together enough yeses, you're in, basically. So let's set a scene for, I guess many of our listeners will, will know already what we're talking about. But for those who either don't, don't frequent art first in New York and around the world, or those who don't know who Paula Cooper is, maybe you could, you could talk for a moment about the kind of scene that you ended up frequenting what the interests of the artists are, what profiles they have in this monstrosity of the New York commercial art scene. Yes. So I'll say first that it's there are really different scenes, and that in itself is fascinating to me. Um, so, for example, artists tend to be younger than collectors. Of course, artists of, are, are of all ages, but they start really entering the art scene after their MFA programs. So a lot of artists I was um, meeting were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, whereas the collectors were mostly in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and so these are really different social scenes. The, the artists tend to hang out in much more casual spaces. So for instance, I'm thinking back to a party I went to or in an artist's studio warehouse and we were playing this game called Chicken Bingo, where there's a bunch of chickens on a bingo board and you throw them chicken feed and they eat it. And the first chicken to sit on the person's number, um, that person wins. And so, you know, th th there's usually like a cooler of PBR there. It's really a casual scene, um, much like the kinds of parties you would go to in your 20s. And that is really, really, really different from hanging out with collectors in penthouses with catered parties where you have um, 
caterers sort of whisking around plates of hors d'oeuvres and fancy cocktails, and everyone's really nicely dressed in sort of funky but designer clothing where they have sort of a bohemian vibe, but everything's really expensive. And these are just like the most beautiful apartments you've ever seen in your life overlooking Central Park. But what's really interesting is those scenes actually collide. So collectors want to be hanging out with artists. That's part of what they're buying when they are making a collection. They want to have this sort of intellectual bohemian experience. So they're inviting the artists whose work they collect often to their parties. And the artists are going because they're meeting more collectors there. They're maintaining relationships with their collectors. So while they don't hang out all the time, artists and collectors and dealers aren't in totally separate spheres, but are constantly interacting and sort of bridging really different social scenes. So that's really interesting because there's this very interesting power dynamic that goes uh, that goes on here. For collectors, this is fun and leisure. Yes, it's somewhat of an investment, but it's fun and leisure time where they're hanging out with their collector friends and meeting artists and getting to have fun parties. For artists, some some sometimes they enjoy the collectors that they're meeting, but it's always at least in part work. And it was really interesting to me that collectors had little to no awareness that it was not fully leisure fun time for the artists they were inviting to the party. It was all leisure fun to them. And they were very unaware of the power dynamics, whereas artists were always, always hyper aware of this and often uncomfortable in these really fancy spaces. And so that, that I thought was, as a sociologist, a really interesting dynamic because I was feeling the tension too, like going from the warehouse party to the penthouse party in a single day is a really jarring experience. And so I could really feel how that would be for artists. And just to map this out for people that maybe don't know the New York art scene so well, I think one thing that really surprises people when they learn about my field, like they they think, oh, the art world, like when you say fair, you're going to like a little craft fair. These are huge international fairs. There are hundreds of galleries at these fairs from all over the world. Collectors travel from all over the world. There are there's millions and millions and millions of dollars on the line. These collectors, when they have collections, they're not just a few paintings on a wall. Uh, collectors define themselves as you're only a collector once you have a storage unit for your art. And so they have hundreds, if not thousands of works, most of which are in storage units at any given time. Uh, some of these works are traveling nationally and internationally to museum exhibitions. Uh, this is part of the role of being a collector is that you're loaning out your work. And they're rotating the collection that is hanging in their in their homes pretty much once a year. And so so this is what it means to be a collector. And this is sort of the the ecosystem we're talking about. Hmm, that's a beautiful description. And New York is clearly one of the capitals of the international contemporary art trade and, and the world itself. But I think one of the things that's important to note in your choice of subjects is that you looked mostly at artists who deal with quite traditional aesthetic media. So it's painting, it's sculpture, all sorts of installation experimentation, but what maybe you didn't look at so much are conceptual practices or certain maybe politicized practices. And I'd like us to get, get to that later on, but I really appreciated that you were so upfront and so consistent with these choices, partly because they really betray some historical narratives and some, some very strange ideas that one would not expect us to see continuing in the 21st century. But also they pay homage very, very transparently to the importance of aesthetic judgment, which is what your book actually does beyond being this beautiful fairy tale. Um, I mean, just as, as a compliment, fairy tale is, reads, reads great. And I, to not, to not to spend too much time on myself, I used to run a gallery for about 10 years doing something similar to what you describe dealers doing in in New York, but I did it in London, and I have seen aspects of this art world. I have seen so many of the things that are both problematic and beautiful and kind of cringeworthy that you describe, and partly because not all the artists' names, not all the dealers' names made all that much sense to me for sheer geography, 
I really read this as a kind of Cinderella story. And I do want to ask you a little bit then to maybe give us, give us an idea of what happens when you see artists engaging with, with aesthetic judgment and how you construct your, your theory of aesthetic judgment. So in chapter one, right at the beginning, you open with a story of an artist called Lucky de Bellevue, who, for all I know about the American artistic scene, you could have made up and I was very quick to Google. And it's a kind of archetypal story that you give that of an artist trying to situate themselves within the career, within how others judge them aesthetically. So maybe you could use that as an example of, of how artists see themselves as aesthetic agents and what that means in the relationship to you know, histories of aesthetic judgment and so on. That's a great story to bring up. And this was a really compelling story to me because I could see the connections between Lucky and his dealer and collectors, all of whom uh, I interviewed Lucky, I interviewed his dealer, I interviewed at least one of the collectors of his work, and I observed them all in various fieldwork interactions. So it was a place where I really felt like I could put the whole story together in a compelling way. Lucky was an artist who became most known for weaving together pipe cleaners. And it's hard to explain, but these are, were really beautiful sculptures of pipe cleaners. Um, they were often large uh, scale. Uh, he had one exhibition in the Whitney Museum where they were really sprawling across the entire ceiling of the Whitney, coming down the walls. And so these were really compelling, memorable works. And I think the thing that made them so distinctive was the unique media. This uh, Pipe cleaners aren't a super traditional media for, for, for artists. So it was something that people could readily remember as, quote unquote, the pipe cleaner guy. Even though, uh, it, just I have to say that on the artist's website, pipe cleaners is not the term that it's used. There's another technical sounding descriptor. So that's interesting in itself. Uh, he uses Chanel stems as the term. You know, this is actually like a mini story story in itself about creative visions because you can use whatever term you want but mm. you can say chanel stems as and maybe that's the technical term for it but people see it and they say pipe cleaner guy and you can't really <laughs> escape that so that's sort of also that tiny term it actually encapsulates what it means to try to negotiate your creative vision but it you sort of lose control of it in part when it goes out into the art world because you can't completely control how other people are going to perceive it. So you can say that all you want. People are going to still call you the pipe cleaner guy. And that's actually exactly what they did with Lucky. Um, he had a review, I believe, in the New York Times where Ken Johnson, who was at, time, at that time one of the lead critics, said, these works are great. Why would he do anything else? So, you know, on the surface, that's a compliment. But for an artist, that can be really constraining. And this is the reason I call the book Bound by Creativity. There is this idea of creative visions where you should make distinctive work that is representative of your authentic and distinctive identity as an artist. Uh, and it looks original because this is your unique creative vision, but also that should continue to evolve. So you must continue to experiment over time. So you have to negotiate this sort of delicate balance between consistency and variation here. So when someone says, like, why would this person make anything else? That can be really constraining because, and this is what happened to Lucky, after about 10 years of weaving together pipe cleaners, he simply didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, he tried different variations, so he tried to evolve this. He, you know, wove feathers in, uh, made different shapes, added different colors. But after, you know, 10 or 15 years, it was still pipe cleaners. And so he moved on to other media and he saw these as connected. So he did things like taking plastic bags from Chinatown and sort of cutting them up. He sort of sliced together various DIY media and made collages with that. And he saw certain overarching themes of, let's say, humor DIY design, um, domesticity, and femininity, but these looked really different from the pipe cleaners. And this was the thing he became known for. So he had a lot of trouble 
um, exhibiting these new works in the art world. And when he finally got a new dealer who was willing to exhibit the new works, the, the dealer tried to connect the new works to the old works by using these what he called quote unquote umbrella themes or these overarching conceptual themes. So he's, I was actually in the booth at the art fair trying to sell these works alongside. And he said, don't bring up the pipe cleaners, but if someone brings it up, say how they're connected with these umbrella themes, like they're both using DIY materials, that kind of thing. And, and of course, that can be such a broad range of things. And it turned out for collectors to be too broad. They simply couldn't see these two things as connected. So it's sort of a cautionary tale in, in, in a sense about the, the perils of recognizability. If you become extremely well recognized for a narrow formal element, it can be really hard later in your career to break outside of that because ultimately people value you for the creative vision. They want the thing that is most representative of your creative vision. And for lucky, that was the pipe cleaners. And so I think in terms of how artists see themselves and their own creative decisions, artists are sort of judging their works, not discreetly, but in terms of their body of work. And so they're looking at their past works and saying, this is what I do. And also looking to their, their potential future works and saying, this is what I want to be doing in the future. One of the things I discuss a lot is emotion. Um, emotion plays a really important role in the creative process. Boredom is one of the key emotions that is really a driver of creative decision making. So when Lucky was bored, he stopped making the pipe cleaners, even though he could have still sold them. So that boredom sort of drove him to this new body of work, and he saw them as conceptually connected, the pipe cleaners with this new body of work, but other people don't necessarily buy those same connections. So I think often artists see their creative vision as more broad than other people do, because in their mind, they can see the conceptual connections more clearly. Uh, they know every work that they ever made, whereas a collector, if you're a collector, maybe you just saw that those two pipe cleaner sculptures, and that's what you think of when you think of the artist. Well, this is fantastic, because I think it, it really highlights the value of the approach that you have taken. And, and I think it would be worth dwelling for a moment to delineate the fact that you, you're not an art critic in this work, you're not an art historian, and that actually allows you to, to overcome a very, very basic problem with aesthetic judgment, which is that aesthetic judgment is either now completely unpopular in the kind of discursive art world, because no one can be expected to agree on anything, or at least aesthetic judgment doesn't really solve the problems that you have just highlighted. But as a sociologist, you are able to weave in quite a few different things together. You do have a nice section in the book where you, where you try to take us from Kant to Arendt to, to sociology of the, of the art world. I want to ask you a little bit to, to expand the idea of aesthetics and aesthetic judgment and how you see it theoretically playing out, or rather how you see it replicating itself in these situations that are driven by social relationships, by commerce, by sometimes quite strange attitudes towards this romantic ideas of what it is that artists do. Just to give a little bit of an overview Philosophers have paid a lot more attention to aesthetic judgment, much more so than sociologists traditionally. So the aesthetic philosophy was really core from, from Kant on. One of the, the sort of key insights that I wanted to draw from aesthetic philosophy was that we kind of had the tools from aesthetic philosophy to analyze aesthetic judgment sociologically. We just hadn't really done it yet. So for example, Kant has this concept of census communis, um, which is this idea of while we think that aesthetic judgment is a matter of taste, right, like this is subjective, we also think it's sort of valid to, to if someone doesn't agree with us, like we still find our tastes valid. And if they don't agree with us, we sort of think they're a different type of person than us. And, and Arendt sort of expanded on that and saying, like, we, we form communities around aesthetic judgment. Uh, we find people that confirm our taste and we feel some sort of 
social bond to those people. For for Arendt, also the communication of aesthetic judgment was really important. It only sort of becomes social when it's communicated. So it led me to think about how can we study this empirically? Because that was something that the philosophers hadn't done. Can we sort of look at how people are making aesthetic judgments and how that is involved in sort of the formation of social bonds and communities and a consensus around aesthetic judgment? How are aesthetic judgments being communicated? How are they being sort of rejected or confirmed in the art world? And what sociology gave us is empirical tools, I think, to study the art world, starting with Howard Becker in the early 80s, I would say, um, this was where we started looking at art world sociologically. There are some precursors, but this was really the seminal work where we started to say, this is part of the purview of sociology. You can study art world sociologically. And what Howard Becker and others did was focus on how producers, creative producers made their work as part of this collaborative process with other people. So this focused attention on how you could understand art sociologically, but what they didn't do is actually focus on aesthetic judgment. They were really only interested in the nature of these collaborations, the nature of social networks, how various social influences affected the way that the creative product was made and the resulting creative product. And so then there was like a little bit of a pushback where we said, no, actually, like the the object of the artwork matters. Artworks aren't the same as like a refrigerator. There's something special about them because they are these objects of human expression that we invest with special meaning. And so how can we understand how people are making meaning? Uh, And so sociologists did start to focus on meaning making. But My approach to aesthetic judgment is a little different in that it doesn't just focus on how people make meaning from the artwork once it's been produced, but also how artists make meaning and make aesthetic decisions during the creative process itself. So my approach to aesthetic judgment is different in a couple ways. One, it's it's focused on the producers rather than just the, the intermediaries or consumers. It doesn't. We don't start focusing on aesthetic judgment only after the product has been made, the work has been made, but actually from the conception of the product. I also am interested in aesthetic judgment temporally. So one of my key insights here is that people don't judge work discreetly, but they judge bodies of work. So when they judge an artist's work, they are really thinking about this creative vision. What are the core components of this body of work that makes it unique and distinctive? Um, And to do that, they have to judge the work in the context of the past work. And they're also thinking towards the future work. What might this artist make in the future? Where is this body of work going? So you have to take this sort of temporal approach to aesthetic judgment. Um, And I did that by returning to artist studios repeatedly, by looking at artists at different career stages, by looking at how people judged each artwork within the sort of network of objects. And I also wanted to study this relationally. So I started by interviewing artists, but I quickly realized that Any story of aesthetic judgment in the creative process would be incomplete if I didn't look at these other actors. So that was where I started to focus on how artists' aesthetic judgments were shaped by other people in the art world. How was their communications with dealers and collectors affecting how they thought about aesthetic choices? So in doing that, I was able to, you know, make this a social thing, even though artists were often making works alone. This was still a social process, even in the solitary realm of the studio. And also it allowed me to bring in other sort of social and economic pressures. So that relational aspect is is really palpable throughout the book. And I I love the way that you are able to navigate between these levels completely smoothly, usually with quite a cracking anecdote. As I said, that the book at points reads like a novel. I recall there's a there's a point at which you are sitting on the handlebars of someone's bike going from 
an opening to, to a party, but you talk about the kind of expectation that an artist has to present themselves as a, as a kind of eccentric, as a kind of enfant terrible, which is a role that, frankly, is pleasurable, in my experience, for artists to play, but actually a lot more difficult to balance, a little bit maybe like your, like your bike ride. I'm interested in, in, in your thoughts as to how dealers, in particular, gallerists, respond to those kind of behaviors. Yes, definitely. Um, so, so yes, as you're saying, I had this perilous bike ride with this artist who was very known for for performing eccentricity. So he would, you know, often make a scene at gallery openings. At one point, calling a collector a fat cow at a gallery opening, despite actually having money, he lived an extremely bohemian lifestyle of sort of the quote-unquote starving artists where he would go to bodegas to ask for expired food and would jump turnstiles and subways. So he was sort of living out this sort of starving artist fantasy. Um, he, he had like an artist residency program for his students where he forced them to like sleep in cold buildings and shower with hoses um, to sort of live out this fantasy of being a starving artist in preparation for their future lives in the art world. So this was a really eccentric guy. And what was interesting to me was that collectors really expected that I would say that he, he was sort of crazy and out there because this was part of what they wanted. Um, eccentricity was tied to having a creative vision with other qualities as well. So um, three qualities that were really important um, to having a creative vision were eccentricity, aesthetic obsession. So artists were supposed to be sh a show, it, even though they could sometimes change their work over time, they were really obsessed with certain themes and they had to make their work and they had these enduring obsessions in the uh, with certain themes and, and formal qualities that they had to continue to sort of explore over decades and they were really driven internally. And also sort of this rejection of money, this economic disinterestedness. So if if artists seem to be too self-promotional in, in a professional way, really too professional, this was seen as actually unprofessional in the art world because professionalism was sort of attached to this wanting money, which was then seen as inauthentic and lacking a true commitment to your creative vision. And so you were supposed to give everything over to the creative vision. So how did dealers respond to this? This was a really tricky thing because dealers represented artists sometimes over decades. They had, in many cases, really um, personal, intimate relationships with artists, um, especially because the work was uh, attached to artist's creative vision, which was attached to artist's identity. So this was very personal. And so dealers had to be really delicate in responding to artists. They, a good dealer was supposed to promote the creative vision, which meant that at times you had to sort of put up with or even encourage eccentricity because the sort of eccentricity was tied to the genius of the artist, which was tied to the creative vision. So potentially if you were shutting down that eccentricity, you could be seen as shutting down the artist's creative vision. So they had to sort of allow for this. And there was all sorts of ways that dealers made accommodations for artists' creative vision. So for example, they formed really individualized re working relationships with artists. They understood that artists would go through ebbs and flows in creative production. And so they did not sort of demand the steady output from artists, but they also had to sort of manage artists. So in the case of this one artist who calls the dealer a fat cow, that's a moment that you know was offensive and went a bit too far. And so at that point, the artist starts threatening the relationship with the collector. It's no longer cute eccentricity. It's actually becoming a little offensive. And so the dealer has to then rein that in and say, no, now you have to go make nice with this collector. And so dealers were sort of charged with being sort of the parents for these unruly 
children in some cases, and they saw themselves as in, in, in that capacity. They saw artists as lacking financial know-how, as being visionaries, but sort of incompetent in other spheres of life. And so that it was their job to sort of, to manage that, to be a buffer that buffered them from collectors. Um, the dealers were the ones that dealt with money and they were the one, and so they could avoid um, putting that on artists, which would make the artists be, have too much contact with money. Uh, so they were the economic buffer. They dealt with the finances so that the artists wouldn't have to, both because artists usually often couldn't um, and because artists would then seem to be sullied. They would be contaminated with this association of money. But the way that dealers responded really differed based on artists' statuses. So a very high status artist had a lot of leeway in terms of how they could sort of misbehave, uh, even doing things that were inappropriate or wildly inconvenient because the dealer was really relying on that, or the curator was was really relying on that person. If the if the artist was lower status, especially lower status in relation to the dealer, then the dealer could say like, look, you're causing too much trouble. I can get someone else who's not going to cause as much trouble. And so that was um, a place where status really mattered. But one of the things that was surprising to me was how far dealers went to accommodate artists and the fact that they would sometimes show work that artists really insisted was their new body of work that they wanted to go with, even when they knew that the work was not going to sell well in order to accommodate this creative vision and maintain a long-term relationship with, uh, with artists and be known as a quote unquote good dealer who supported artists' creative visions. Um, and I'll also note that I think that this performance is a lot harder for women to pull off um, and, and and people that have been traditionally um, marginalized in the art world. And women were aware that this was not the sort of presentation that would be seen as cute and eccentric and would instead look at unprofessional if they were to perform in this way. So I think it is more often um, a performance that is taken on by men, um, especially white men. I don't know whether I would completely agree. On the surface, yes, white men can get away with a hell of a lot more than anyone else. But because the art world is quite fragmented and has very different concerns depending on where you go, one ends up expecting very different concerns to be amplified through these kind of codified behaviours. So I guess I guess that the London and New York scenes are a little bit different in as much as New York is fueled to a greater extent by traditional art forms. But in London, we have a lot more discursive space for politics and contemporary art. And those kind of artistic practices, which is what I used to be engaged with, actually leave a lot more space for all sorts of dissent that codifies itself in very, very different ways. But I wonder, I wonder if you have any further thoughts, particularly on kind of stories of failure. You know, the fat cow comment is kind of one level of one level of behavior and one level of performance. But it might be a little bit different when we're still competing for attention or we're still competing for money when we are sleeping in cold buildings. And I don't know whether it's host showers for, for all artists or not. But the art world is filled with so much precarity that for a lot of artists, there is a real risk that, that actually you don't get to control the game. You don't get to control whether the code is going to turn out in your favor or not. And that's a great point. And I think the art world is this example of what we call in sociology a winner-take-all market. But we see this across creative industries. This is a core characteristic of creative industries that both critical and commercial success is highly concentrated among a few top actors. So you have the winners taking almost all of the spoils, and then you have everyone else, 99%, just scrambling for the scraps. And so that absolutely characterizes the New York City contemporary art market and the contemporary art more market more broadly. Um, I think these dynamics are especially heightened in New York 
because it's sort of a notoriously competitive city across all sectors. And you see all of these dynamics getting heightened to just an extreme degree. There's the most money, there's the most fame, there's the most everything. So absolutely, I think there are real risks for for most of the artists that I studied. Um, some of them, the more established artists, were living pretty comfortable lives. But even the, they, you know, did many of them did need to continue to exhibit and sell their work um, at least on some level. And then most of the artists uh, were really still trying to make it. I think one of the really tough things about creative industries in general, um, but definitely including contemporary art, is that creative producers and including contemporary artists are not salaried employees, right? Art dealer does not give them a salary every year. They only make money when they sell artwork. And it is really difficult to string together year after year after year, a steady schedule of exhibitions and put out exhibition after exhibition for, for multiple reasons. One, because I think it's difficult, like you, the, the creative process itself is one that ebbs and flows. So I discuss how the creative process works. And um, one of the things I discuss is that there's this phase of what I call low stakes experimentation, where artists are working with sketches and models and just trying things out um, in a way that's cheap and fast. And then when they identify a promising direction, they repeat that in future works and progressively make a big painting or sculpture or another kind of object that is a sort of more high stakes object. And then they recognize the interesting aspect of that and repeat it in future works. But that process almost necessarily leads to phases of ebbs and flows, um, phases where you're doing more high, st low stakes experiments and phases where you're doing more execution. And so how does an artist string together enough shows that they can not only survive when the sales are coming in, but also in the times where they aren't, uh, when they are just experimenting in their studio and trying to figure out the next thing. Um, and also to sustain sales over a career is very, very difficult. So artists can become known for something and people want that thing, but then to try to create the next thing and the next thing and the next thing um, where people are still seeing oh, this is attached to the creative vision, but also something new. And I also want this new thing, but I see it as also iconic enough. That's such a delicate balance. So I think artists do face real risks. Um, they are in very precarious positions. There's also this level of career precarity that comes from just the infrastructure of galleries where most galleries don't make it. They close down. And so when a gallery closes down, those artists have to find another gallery to represent them. And that can also be a really tough time that artists really have no control over. I mean, one of the artists I interviewed used this wonderful term called like overcoming success. And she said that was the hardest thing for her to overcome success. And so this was an artist named Gina Beavers. Uh, she, she used this relief painting method where she built up layers of paint until they were almost a sculptural form on the canvas. And she worked with different, uh, different images, mostly from social media, like makeup tutorials or so-called food porn, and would then recreate these as relief paintings. And so the, her initial series got a lot of attention. She sold out that series. And then people were looking to say, see, like, what's the next thing she's going to do? And it was kind of a deer in the headlights moment for her. She thought, okay, I can't just make another series of makeup tutorials and then another series of makeup tutorials. I have to do a different series, but what is it going to be? What is connected thematically? What is conceptually and formally connected to what I've already done, but also different enough? And so I think that is such a hard thing to manage because it's not just one time that you have to manage that question, but you have to manage that question and confront it repeatedly over the course of your career. So all of those factors lead to um, 
a, a life of economics instability for most artists. So you, you describe this process of experimentation in a chapter that um, is set in a studio and is also connected to the emotional lives and attitudes of artists. So I, I wonder whether we could delve into the studio a little bit, talk about the ritual of the studio visit, but in relation to these kind of high and low stakes of experimentation, which is something that, that artists do have to manage, I'm also wondering a little bit how you see artists' identities contributing to the directions that they end up taking. So a studio visit for um, those that may be less acquainted with the art world is um, can mean a variety of things, but basically it's when an artist invites someone else to visit their studio. And sometimes these are peers um, that they might invite to critique a work in progress. Other times it's a more um, high stakes professional visit. Um, they might invite, let's say, a collector or a curator who's interested in their work. And in that case, they're going to sh- the, the artist gets to choose what work to show to the to the visitor, and the visitor really respects the the, the artist's choices. And, and, and it's a, the studio visit was universally talked about as a pretty sensitive thing. So people didn't want to say something that could derail an artist's creative vision, especially if the work was in progress. They understood that this was a really vulnerable moment for artists to be sharing their creative vision. So I did almost all of my interviews in artist studios. I also, on occasion, would accompany collectors and dealers to studio visits. But often they would say, like, actually, you can't come because it's too sensitive. So this was the sensitivity of the studio visit also made it um, a place that was difficult for access. But one of the things that came out really strongly when I would interview artists in their studio was this emotional aspect. And um, just to talk briefly about how I would interview artists, methodologically, I would try to identify works that were at different stages of completion. So I would ask artists, can you go through your sketchbook with me? Can um, are there works in storage that you would be willing to show me? Um, are there works that you haven't finished? And this really allowed me to get at different stages of the creative process because I could ask, oh, why didn't you decide not to do anything with the sketch? Um, what are you thinking with this work that's been hanging unfinished on the wall for three months? Like, tell me what you're thinking about this next decision. Um, oh, you put this in storage and it's not finished. Why did you decide to abandon this particular work? And so it really allowed me to get at these different moments in the creative process. And I found that these moments were really, as I said before, driven by um, these emotional reactions that artists were having. And this was part of the reason why, you know, initially it was infuriating to interview artists because I would ask them to tell me about why they did something and they would be like, well, you know, it worked or, um, you know, it just, that's what resonated with me or um, it was just intuition. And as a sociologist, that isn't exactly the most (laughs) useful response to get, but I started taking that response more and more seriously and listening to what they were trying to tell me, which was that emotions were really key in their decision-making process. And I found that they were consistently identifying the same emotions as attached to certain creative decisions. So artists would do low-stakes experiments, and then they would feel excitement towards certain elements of these experiments. And that would be a key to them. That would be like a sign that they should continue to experiment with these elements. And so they would make more variations of these works. Sometimes they wouldn't be sure how it resonated with their creative vision. They would feel excitement when they felt both this element of surprise, but also that it was resonating with their creative vision, that it was relevant to them. Sometimes they would feel like, okay, this is interesting, but I'm not sure how it resonates with my creative vision. And this was a moment of ambivalence. And when that happened, they would pause a work and just leave it hanging in the studio or leave it on the ground somewhere until it sort of came to them what they should do next with this work. And then as they continued to experiment with these elements that they felt were relevant 
to their creative vision that at some point had elicited excitement, ultimately they would feel like, okay, I've kind of run out of interesting variations. I'm starting to feel boredom. And boredom was this moment where they would abandon the work. So these emotions were really important, but these emotions were also attached to not only the level of surprise they were experiencing, uh, but also how they felt like the work was tied to their creative vision. And I think this is where artist identity comes in. You know, a lot of this what's relevant to my creative vision comes from the previous works they've made, which is, okay, what have I made in the past and what what have I identified in the past as consistencies in the creative process? And they both identified consistencies um, during the creative process. Once they repeated certain elements, they said, oh, that's a repeated element. This must be consistent. This must be something that's relevant to my creative vision. Um, But also they would look back at their body of work. So, you know, an artist would say, I went to a retrospective of my body of work and I was surprised by how many consistencies I saw. And and I thought, you know, this really is what represents my body of work. So a lot of it comes from their past work. They're, They're judging works not discreetly, but in this network of all of the works that they've produced in the past. But it's also about other aspects of their identity. So it certainly was no coincidence that female artists were more likely to work with domestic themes or themes of feminism. Black artists I interviewed uh, were more likely to talk about racism and social justice. Um, so, uh, So various aspects of artists' identity definitely were tied to their creative vision. And that's because the creative vision is is associated with artists' authentic identity. It's the same reason that people care if an artist is eccentric or showing aesthetic obsession or showing economic disinterestedness. It's the reason that they care about the artist's personality and identity because they view that as inextricably tied to the creative vision. So the two can't be separate. The, the artist's perception of their identity as, as people more broadly is shaping what they see as relevant to their creative vision. And when other people judge the creative vision, they're also taking that into account. Uh, how do they see the artist as a person and how does that fit with what they make? I want us now to scoot past past some of the exhibition paraphernalia, because I guess most of our listeners will have been to a contemporary art gallery. And I want to use the work that you have done on, on the other end of the transaction. I want us to look a little bit towards collectors and towards art first. How do we, how do we get away from the artist's studio in which things are kind of so bound with identity, the gallery and criticism in which everything is kind of scripted? I love, I love this idea of a style script that you introduce, you know, the press release as a script where everyone just kind of walks around and repeats the same lines and validates the work in exactly the same way. So I'd like us to to slowly make a move towards the collector's apartment where none of that matters anymore. Yeah, and that that was so interesting to me. Collectors, I think I had a slightly purely sort of ethnographic interest in them um, as this sort of uh, wholly different species that I had never encountered before. And so I had this innate fascination with them and it was really interesting to follow them around to go into these homes that I didn't really imagine even existed before. And they were quite different, as, as I've discussed, than the artists. They had a really different life, different, different concerns, different personality. Collectors were interested in a few things. Um, one of the things I was surprised by when I started interviewing not only collectors, but also dealers, was that this term, this a vision was also coming up with them. Like they were speaking about their own vision. And so I spent a lot of time grappling with this question, like, is that a creative vision too? Like, can I count that as a creative vision? Is Certainly it's not exactly the same as an artist's creative vision because they're not producing work themselves. But ultimately, I felt like what they were doing, even though it was different, was also satisfying this definition that I had of a creative vision in that they were composing a body of work, in their case, the work of multiple different artists, and they were identifying 
core consistencies across that body of work, that they felt tied the body of work together. Um, And in composing the body of work, they had some act of creation itself. So they had this body of work that they collected. As they collected work, they thought, oh, these are really my interests. This is what's sort of relevant to me. They would then look for more work that resonated in similar ways. So even though there was no collections that were exclusively black and white or exclusively photography collections, they saw sort of looser connections or themes across their work and would try to collect work accordingly so that, and because they thought, you know, this is what a good collector does. A good collector doesn't just collect the blue chip work, the most iconic work of every blue chip artist because that would not be a distinctive collection. So just as artists are trying to make their bodies of work distinctive, collectors are trying to make their collections distinctive and say, this is my unique point of view. This is my creative vision, which I'm showcasing when you come to see my collection because I've put these works together in a unique way. So that was really interesting to me that they were attending to their own creative visions. But I was also interested in how they were judging, okay, there's more work in the world that could potentially fit into your creative vision than, of course, you can buy. So what works are you choosing? They were, on the one hand, looking for um, artists who were well-known and they wanted the most, the iconic work of that artist because those works were representing the creative vision the most. And typically they would only buy less iconic works once they already owned the more iconic works by the same artist. And they would especially prefer iconic work when choosing the work of more established artists whose work was more expensive because then it was more important for them that the work retained economic value. Um, It was a more important buy, economically speaking, and they knew that iconic works were more likely to remain important in the future. And so they tended towards iconic works of blue chip artists when they collected works of less established artists. They these works were less expensive. They cared less about the works increasing in economic value. The work of more emerging artists also provided them with the opportunity to make their collections distinctive because less people had bought the work of a more emerging artist. They were more likely to have different tastes than those of their collector friends in this regard. And since they didn't need these works to retain economic value, they could sometimes, sometimes they would purchase the iconic work, but sometimes they would purchase a less iconic work and they would say, you know, this is what makes the collection quirky and distinctive. And one of the really interesting things to me when I was interviewing collectors was that this sort of status games they played with each other. And to me, this said so much about um, class and taste, which has a long history in sociology. Um, And so one of the ways I noticed that they were jockeying for status among each other, so this was how sort of elites maintain status among other elites, was um, through what I call narratives of aesthetic confidence. By this, I mean that they were saying, not only do I have good taste, but I'm also willing to put my money where my mouth is. I am a leader. I am. I trust my own taste, and I am willing to buy something because I think it's good, and I don't need other people to tell me it's good. So I'm willing to buy this thing before everyone else does. And I want other people to also know that I bought this first because this shows that I have better taste. And so collectors would um, sort of try to one-up each other in this regard, say, oh, you know, this person says they bought it early, but I actually bought it earlier than this person did. In this way, they said, like, I'm the true leader of the crowd. I have confidence in my ta- I have confidence in my own creative vision. And my creative vision is actually leading the way. Um, And there was this really amazing flexibility they had around when something, when they bought something that was a success, 
economically speaking that other people later bought and that it went up in price, they would say, you know, this shows how I'm sort of in the vanguard, that I'm in front of everyone else in terms of my taste because they're following me. If they bought something and it tanked, no one else bought it, it went down in value, they would say, well, this just shows that I'm so far ahead of the crowd that the market <laughs> hasn't caught up to me yet. So either way, they could legitimate themselves as having aesthetic confidence. And they played a lot of narrative games, not only to, to me in interviews, but also with each other in interaction, sort of jockeying around this. So it's beautiful because you've mixed for the first time in a conversation the idea of taste with your formal phrasing of a creative vision. So collectors don't necessarily always have a collective vision, if I heard you correctly. Sometimes they have this plain old-fashioned taste. And, and the question which you do explore, which I find really interesting, is, is where they get these tastes from, you know, where they acquire, acquire their ideas. And to go back to this kind of function of criticism, function of theory, you cite time and time again collectors who are adamant that they don't care what the critics say. They don't want to be convinced to buy anything. They want to be seen speculating with their taste. And as you just say, it doesn't really matter what the results are because you can only really win. But I think it would be super interesting because that's something that isn't really well known even in the art world, like it takes, takes some skill to observe how taste travels with collector couples. You have this beautiful, my God, I've experienced this so many times showing at an art fair that a person who's clearly there as part of a couple stands in front of a work with the wallet already open. And then they say, I just need to ask my husband or wife what they think. And at that point, you know, okay, there's no sale happening yet. But anyhow, it would be great to to have an insight from you about how these ideas of creative visions or, or individual tastes travel in the collector elite that you that you studied. Yeah, I mean that was something I was really interested in because what I found so striking was how they use the same words down to the same metaphors. So one of the really the metaphor that I heard over and over was I buy with my eyes, not with my ears. And what that meant was they don't listen to recommendations by other people. They buy with their own eyes. Um, they buy based on their own taste, not through hearsay of what's you know popular. And so this was a central uh, narrative around this idea of aesthetic confidence. And I thought, how is everyone saying the same thing? Uh, that's so strange um everyone, and also so beautifully vague right right you know. exactly and and so and so i mean it became very quickly clear to me that just and, and despite the fact that they're saying i don't buy with my ears they're all saying the exact same thing um so clearly they're talking to each other um and so this was really interesting to me because you know as they said they would sort of discount oh i don't listen to critics i read them but I won't buy something on that basis alone. Maybe I'll go there just to check it out, but I'm not going to buy it because this critic said that it was good. Only if I think it's good will I buy it. And they would also use the same rhetoric of friendship and fun to sort of downplay the recommendations they were getting from other collectors. They would say, oh, yeah, we go look at stuff together, but because we're friends and it's fun and we're hanging out together and, yes, you know, this might come up, oh, I bought that, I bought that, but that comes up in the space of our friendship and not as a formal recommendation. So sort of downplaying these ties, making them seem informal and, and downplaying the re reliance on it allowed them to say, to, to actually access these recommendations without, without admitting that they were relying on them. And it also allowed them to look down on those who had more formal recommendations. So collectors routinely looked down on other collectors who used art advisors because they said that, okay, those people need to buy their taste. I have taste. I don't need to buy it. But, you know, these people all grew up with um, exposure um, either from a young age or sort of intensive training in adulthood in the art world. So a lot of all of the younger collectors I spoke with 
um, had parents who were collectors and deeply involved in the art world. And so they were people who, from a young age, were taken around to galleries. One of the people I interviewed who was around um, at my age in her, her early 30s um, said that she got to choose one piece for her own collection every year as a child um, from an early age. And then when she graduated from college, she got to choose her first major work that ended up traveling to museums. And she describes her taste as is, quote, in her DNA. And this is a central in sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. The way we justify our taste is better as better than others is because we experience this taste as innate. You know, you like pizza, you don't like pizza. That's something that can't be trained. It's just part of who you are. So if I have better taste, it's because I'm just a more refined person. And so that was a really interesting rhetoric in the art world. And it was also paired with this rhetoric of actual hard work. So there were some collectors who came to the art world later in life. Perhaps they married someone who was in the art world. And, and that's when they really started going to exhibition openings. I, I noticed all of them had sort of mentors. They would have friends who took them around or um, they would enroll in courses. So this was a more explicit and formal training that took place. And they described it as like, I spent years doing this. I um, trained my eye through this process of hard work. So either way, whether it's through your DNA or through hard work, um, either way, your taste is sort of legitimized. Ah, it's fantastic. I, I love that you mentioned Bourdieu, who, of course, does, does come up in the book time and time again. It will be difficult to write about art without reference to him. One of the reasons I love what he does is that he's ruthless and he likes the idea of class conflict and conflicts of taste. And he's very, very unflattering to people's descriptions of their own taste and their own achievements. So I want to maybe fish a little bit because there's not that much of us in the book, but I want to fish in your experience for examples of conflict. And one that, that I, I remember in the book is a, is a story of a black artist who was represented in a collection and used to be on show in a private apartment. So clearly you met at the party in this apartment of the collectors. And the artist said that the wife in the, in the collecting couple just didn't like work that made her uncomfortable. Therefore, it had to go. I mean, it had to go to storage or had to be given to a museum and, and so on and so on. So the question, I guess, is a little bit about the boundaries of the kind of materialities and genres of artistic practices and collecting practices that you've looked at and how they connect to the more contentious aspect of artistic production. It would be interesting to find whether you've experienced some kind of rub or whether, whether you've, you've found that these worlds are just completely disconnected from each other. Yeah, I would say, um, and, and I did make this like clear methodological choice to focus on more traditional art objects. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest reasons I did this was because I wanted to be able to see how these objects traveled through the art world and how different people judge these objects. And so, um, and I wanted to get this economic element in. Um, I wanted to see how aesthetic judgments functioned in a market, um, which required purchasing objects. Hmm. Um, and so, yes, there, there, um, there was a that necessarily left out um, a lot of what's important in contemporary art, which happens in, in performances or digitally or in these more ephemeral social actions. They were somewhat separate and somewhat not. There were definitely, you know, collectives of artists that I didn't focus on much that um, did sort of relational aesthetics, different types of work that was more non-object based or artists that focus more on digital art, which I also focused less on. Um, on the other hand, one thing that really surprised me was how most artists actually that I studied define themselves as interdisciplinary. And mm. some of those interdisciplinary artists made works in different media, but not, but all object based work, whereas some of those artists made performances in addition um, to their their more traditional works. And often these functioned in tandem. Um, so for example, I went several times to gallery openings where the artists had some sort of performance in the space. 
And the performance happened in tandem with the show. The performance was something they were not selling, but they were selling the works on the wall. And I think this had um, a really symbiotic relationship because by by having the performance in the space, by having something you couldn't sell in the space, the gallery and the artists were legitimating themselves as economically disinterested, at least to a certain extent, as more critically oriented. Um, but they also then had the things that you could sell. So they were kind of mm. having their cake and eating it too in this respect. So I think there is um, not a strict distinction, but more and more artists will work across disciplines and media, including making non-traditional art objects in tandem to their practice, which includes art objects. You know, you you also mentioned this sort of conflict, um, this moment where this um, Black artist, the, the work is sort of traded back because the, the, it's, it's a de depiction of slavery that's very graphic, and the collector's wife at least does not want it in the home. And so this brings up like a really interesting difference of what people like, what people want to see versus what they want to buy. So collectors might be interested in going to a wide variety of different kinds of shows, but they don't necessarily want to look at all of those works over breakfast. And maybe some of this is changing a bit, um, I think, especially with the BLM movement. This, I think, is starting to change. but. Often collectors will not have work that's overly graphic, that is um, disturbing, also work that's difficult to maintain archivally, that, you know, the frozen cat food would be an example of something that, that would be really difficult to maintain in their collection and they're responsible. Well, it depends if you have a cat or not. Yes, yeah, I guess it depends on if you have a cat. Um, and actually some collectors relish this. They, they want to be seen as a collector who collects quote unquote difficult work because that makes them even more prestigious. This shows that they're fully committed to the work, that it's not just about um, the dollar value for them, that they are committed to maintaining this difficult, unruly work over time. And also there's this element of what we call, what is sort of newly called in sociology, cultural matching. This is this new term that's come up recently. Um, and that's this idea that people want to consume or want to select products that match their own cultural background. And this is validated across art worlds, really, including non-contemporary art, art worlds, because it's seen to, to be legitimate to choose something based on your own taste. And it's acceptable and expected that your taste will be tied to your own background and experiences. So a collector can then say, you know, this work isn't objectively bad. It's just not relevant to my creative vision, which of course is tied to their own personal background. And most collectors are are white heterosexual couples. Um, I, I really, I wasn't trying to chastise you for your choice and your, your boundaries of, of your studies. In fact, I find it's really, really fascinating that you focused on the kind of collections and artistic practices that you did because even to someone like me who has been in both this part of the art world and the more political one, I have forgotten or maybe never realized how alive a lot of these kind of romantic mythologies that you describe still are. That actually a lot of actors in the art world still have very traditional ideas that somehow did not go away in the latter half of the 20th century. And one of the things that you highlight towards the end of the book, which I also really loved, is that status signals are not exactly the same thing as aesthetic judgment. Hannah, I want to ask you a couple of things as we come to an end. One, I want to ask you about your plans for, for further research. I know that you're back in New York for the summer. But more importantly, are you going to secure a studio visit with Hunter Biden? And are you going to write about him in your next book? Yes, there's this uh, yeah, strange trend of, of politicians, including Bush, you know, trying to <laughs> become artists. Um, I think I might I might skip that one, <laughs> but uh, but we'll see if, if he invites me, maybe. Um, <laughs> well, we'll get that arranged. I, I want to secure a White House visit as well, of course. Um, but yeah, in terms of my future plans, I mean, once the pandemic hit, I was I was poised to move to LA actually, and the p pandemic hit, um, and I thought, what is an ethnographer to do in this situation? Um, so I started 
sort of um, frenetically collecting archival data sets like a squirrel uh, storing nuts for winter. Um, <laughs> and, and that's and that's been what's getting me through at the moment, at least while while in person ethnography is somewhat tenuous still right now. Um, so I'm continuing my work on the contemporary art world. One of the things I did, which was and have some silver lining, I guess, to the pandemic was the contemporary art fairs, specifically like Freeze and the Armory Show um, and Art Basel all went online very unexpectedly. So um, Art Basel was supposed to happen March 2020. So that was a moment where they scrambled really quickly to make um, what they called online viewing room. So each gallery that was supposed to be in person then was out online. And they continued this through um, the further iterations of the fair um, over the course of the year um, in both um, Basel, Hong Kong, and Miami. So we were able to see full information, including for most works, prices. Um, so that's a data set that I've scraped and I'm currently analyzing. Um, and I think can tell us a lot about both um, determinants of price and, and global flows of artworks um, in the contemporary art market because prices have been notoriously opaque in both the primary, especially the primary market, but to a certain extent also the secondary market. So never before have we had the opportunity to have gallery prices across hundreds of galleries. Um, so this is an exciting data set for me. Um, I'm working on a few other data sets that are not involved in the contemporary art market. I'm a sociologist of culture who studies creative industries broadly. So a lot of my work has focused on the contemporary art market, but I'm also studying other markets, including academia, very navel gazing, <laughs> uh, as well as technology. Um, so I have a few other projects related to that, and I'm hoping to be able to make it to LA in 2022. Um, now that I'm at uh, UC Santa Barbara, as an ethnographer, you sort of look at, okay, I need to be in person, at least for um, non-digital ethnographies. Uh, what can I do in this area? I'm, I'm really lucky to be situated near LA, which is, of course, a major location for creative industries. Um, so uh, I think my next book will be uh, not on the contemporary art market, but on another creative industry. And I'm trying to currently identify what industry in LA I might focus on. Well, you'll be spoiled for choice. But before that, I hope to see you at the Armour Show in September, travel restrictions permitting. Yes, I'm actually planning on attending, I think. So hopefully we will see each other there. Fantastic. Hannah, thank you so much for this conversation and for your fascinating book. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to, to be here. <laughs> Bound by Creativity, How Contemporary Art is Created and Judged by Hannah Wall is published by University of Chicago Press. I'm Pierre Delancey and the editor is Marshall Poe. Thank you for listening and join us next time.